Thank you very much for your very kind words of uh, welcome and uh, uh, thank you uh, very much for having invited me. It's really a, a pleasure uh, not only to be in Dublin, uh, although shortly, too shortly, but uh, to participate in this uh, event of the Institute for International and European Affairs. Um, I must say I wish I could have made an address on something like the URIA's new strength, you know, something in that vein. Uh, I think, uh, nevertheless, you were right to, uh, to choose the, the title Fixing, Fixing Europe's Financial Crisis for this conference, um, <clears throat> because we are uh, indeed faced with a number of uh, difficulties and uncertainties. Uh, growth is sluggish. Uh, the necessary reforms are demanding. And financial markets are uh, still very volatile. Uh, but I think there is at least one extremely positive element that emerges from this gloomy picture. And that is uh, that we, we think we know now what is needed to fix Europe's financial crisis. And what we need, in my view, is three interlinked challenges uh, to be taken up simultaneously. Uh, fiscal discipline, uh, boosting long-term growth, and, and uh, complete the monetary union with the financial union. And I, I want to say a few words on these three aspects of what I see as a novel solution uh, to the crisis. But before that, I would like to make a few remarks on the uh, situation in Ireland. Because I think your country, and I very often uh, use this argument uh, in other places uh, that your country is the perfect illustration that the solutions I'm going to talk about are the right ones and that they work. Uh, first, before the crisis, Ireland demonstrated that a strong fiscal consolidation is compatible with growth and you succeeded in bringing down your public debt to GDP ratio from around 130% in the early 90s to less than 30%. You told me 25%, I think, around. Um, that was in the, in the mid-2000s, uh, while enjoying, of course, strong growth during these years. Um, second Ireland was badly hit by the banking crisis of 2008 and required an EU IMF program, uh, which your country has perfectly implemented since then, understanding rapidly that significant efforts were required. I think you made the right, though difficult decisions quickly, cutting public spending, lowering wages where needed, implementing a number of structural reforms, although you did less than, than other countries, uh, to be honest. And as a result, your public deficit has considerably decreased. You returned to a path of growth last year, notably thanks to the competitiveness of your exports. You even managed to successfully return to the short-term securities uh, market earlier this month for the first time since 2010. Well, this success, to me, shows two very important things. One, that if a country follows its program carefully, and makes the necessary efforts, it works. And I think this should inspire the other countries in the program. And second, uh, that European economic integration is essential in good as in bad times. The fact that more than 60% of the people in this country voted in favor of the latest referendum, to me, illustrates that uh, the population understood this, very, uh, this, this, this point very well. Now, back to the three main instruments that I think are needed to fix our crisis, uh, and starting with the fiscal consolidation efforts which need to be, to be pursued. Um, if we look to what happened since uh, 1998, uh, and the deep reasons for the crisis of the URIA, uh, I think this crisis is rooted in the individual and collective inability to have followed a fiscal discipline during the first decade of existence of the single currency. And, that the, and that's the most important reason. It's not the only one. We'll come back on some others. But 
That's the most important. So the cure begins with fiscal consolidation and even more importantly, a credible fiscal discipline framework. Uh, the efforts which have already been made on the fiscal front by the individual countries of the area, I think are already bearing fruit. Not only is the absolute level of the URIA's deficit half of that of all the major economies, but also the pace of fiscal consolidation is actually much greater. So if we compare what happens in this area to what happens, say, on the other side of, I was about to say the channel, for you it's not the channel, but you know what I mean. Uh, yes, your neighbor. Or on the other side of the Atlantic, or uh, somewhere in the Pacific, I think we have not, uh, um, we, we have uh, nothing to, um, to be fearing of uh, in terms of comparison. Uh, and I think this is clear and an asset for us today. And, and it must be an element of confidence both for the markets and for economic agents, uh, which needs, of course, to be further enhanced. Beyond <clears throat> these national efforts, uh, a more powerful common discipline framework has been put in place, which represents uh, significant progress towards a, a more integrated economic union. <clears throat> uh, we, we have to uh, realize that the uh, legislative package, the so-called six-pack, uh, which entered into force in December, considerably reinforces the stability and growth pact with surveillance power for the European Commission of the national budgets uh, enhanced sanctions, uh, which have become quasi-automatic. The criteria for public debt and public spending are being more closely scrutinized. And in addition, the Treaty on Stability, Coordination, and Governance establishes a comprehensive new fiscal compact, including a particular requirement uh, for a structural uh, government deficit not exceeding uh, half a percentage point of GDP. Uh, and I think we need all that. We needed all that. We need that to be uh, duly implemented. Uh, and that is not impairing growth. Why? Because at current debt levels, economic agents would react to fiscal permissiveness simply by delaying their own private expenditure. And that at the same time, with the same kind of permissiveness, financial markets could continue to impose punitive interest rates on our countries to compensate for the uncertainty of the fiscal outlook. And overall, the confidence and financial benefits of fiscal consolidation, to me, far outweighs its negative effect on the uh, effective demand in the short term. And it is of the essence that all the efforts on this side be decisively pursued. Now, moving to the second aspect, the growth-enhancing measures which are needed. Um, to me, another major explanation of the crisis is the development of competitiveness gaps between the area countries throughout the, the last decade. Um, here, I, I think the economic rationale is easy to understand, but uh, not, many, uh, not many governments have thought about that uh, before, the, before the crisis. When you join a monetary union where the goal set by the central bank in implementation of its mandate is to achieve a rate of inflation or just below 2%, changes in unit production costs must be in line with this ob objective because the central bank is credible and will manage to achieve the objective anyhow. Uh, it must be in line, modulo, I would say, the productivity changes, productivity gains. So if you make 1% productivity gains on average, you may have an increase in production costs of 3%, which while keeping your relative productivity. If you make 2%, you can have 4%, etc. But if you have a uh, half a percentage point of productivity gains, and during 10 years you increase the wages, in the, in, in the private sector and in the public sector by, say, 5 6% a year. After a decade, you've lost 30 to 40%, and you are dead. And some in the URIA are in this situation. 
or have been in this situation. It's as simple as that. Uh, I can tell you every month in the Eurogroup before the beginning of the crisis, the president of the ECB was invited by the ministers and would typically come with a graph showing the evolution of labor, product, uh, labor unit, uh, the, uh, production unit costs uh, and uh, in, in, including productivity changes, of course. And this graph was clearly demonstrating that they were going into the wall. And he was telling them every month, you are going into the wall. But nobody would listen to him because uh, there was no evidence of, of any problem. Um, so this is why it is so important that the new stability and growth pact now provides a framework for the surveillance of macroeconomic imbalances and for competitiveness development. Um, so it's clear that it's one of the major factors for long-term growth and that uh, it is extremely important that we succeed in boosting uh, competitiveness today. Now, you will tell me, how can we do that? Uh, basically, through structural reforms of the goods and services and labor markets, for instance. And I must say that the progress made in some fields by some countries are, to me, extremely impressive and very encouraging. And I think in recent history, never European economies have reformed so extensively in such a brief period of time. And I could cite many examples. Uh, some of the most uh, obvious uh, are the labor market reforms in Spain and in Italy. We know that in, if you take Spain, for instance, the degree of uh, cost competitiveness was not that bad, but uh, uh, the productivity of the economy was deeply uh, hampered by uh, the rigidities in the labor market. So changing that is absolutely key to restore an, a growth engine in this economy now that the uh, uh, bubble uh, has gone. Uh, we could also mention the pension reforms in countries like Italy and France. Uh, such reforms, anyhow, are a necessary foundation for dynamic and sustainable growth in the future, and, and they must be vigorously pursued. Uh, having said that, uh, and without uh, endangering the very constrained fiscal situation, uh, there may be also some room for some direct public support uh, growth measures. Uh, and I think those uh, which have been chosen, which may uh, uh, help a little bit the economy, uh, uh, the economic re recovery to, uh, to take place and accelerate using money which is already uh, um, earmarked in the, in the European funds or using the tool of the uh, um, European Investment Bank uh, or, uh, is, a, is a very good idea. And I think this this uh, uh, 120 billion package adopted by the, by the summit is, is a very good thing. Now, what about the central bank? And we often hear people asking, why doesn't the ECB support growth more actively? Uh, actually, the, the ECB and the euro system have done a lot for supporting growth since the beginning of the crisis. Uh, by several channels. The so first one is the fact that we have maintained price stability, and never forget price stability for us uh, is both to avoid excessive inflation and to avoid deflation or too low inflation. Maintaining price stability throughout the crisis is really the key asset uh, to provide confidence, to preserve the purchasing power of the citizens, uh, and to, uh, uh, to clarify the, uh, the future for uh, decision makers uh, of investments in the, in the private sector, in the corporate sector. Second, of course, we have constantly provided all possible support within the scope of our mandate to help the banking system overcome its difficulties. Uh, and it is all the more important in, in an economy where uh, most of the financing of the economy comes, from, uh, comes through banks 
so that has been a major contribution to economic activity and, and growth. And one, one example among many uh, has been the, the two or three years LTA rules. Well, the, the idea there was really to remove the funding pressures of, for, from the banking sector uh, to allow for a smooth adaptation to new routes and to um, prevent a major credit crunch that would, of course, have compromised uh, uh, the economic recovery uh, and also, by the way, the maintenance of price stability. Uh, but uh, this, of course, helps and can help, but does not uh, uh, remove the responsibility of governments to revive growth through a credible fiscal path and, and structural reforms. Um, now, third element, institutions and uh, uh, the issue of the financial union. I think it's a, a, th a third very important reason why the URA has been hit badly by, by the crisis. We are a very integrated uh, economic area without having all the appropriate institutional mechanisms for in integration. And one clear um, example of that was uh, the financial sector, which is we had, uh, we had seen the banking sector starting to, uh, to become more and more a, a European banking sector, a URIA banking sector, uh, investing in various countries but without uh, having done anything from the institutional standpoint to change the basic relationship between governments and their banks. And of course, this was not apparent during a decade because there was no problem. But the day uh, the first episode of the crisis came, I mean the episode starting in the United States uh, uh, and culminating uh, just after Lehman Brothers uh, failed, it became evident with a number of governments all around the world supporting their banks, and indeed uh, uh, that, that, that was a, a difficult experience also in this country, uh, but almost everywhere there was some, some help or some support for some time. Then it clearly appeared to market players that uh, the link between banks and sovereign was extremely strong, and that in the end, uh, the capacity of the banking sector to survive uh, in case of adverse developments was depending on the capacity of the, of the state, of the government, to support it. And on the other hand, that uh, in case the banking sector was weak, then the the, the finances of, uh, of a member state would suffer. And of course, all this is extraordinarily important because uh, uh, we have seen uh, negative feedback loops uh, created uh, at a time where the uh, good and current functioning of the banking sector was so vital for, uh, for the URIA economy. Um, and uh, where uh, uh, governments were challenged uh, uh, on the markets. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to have something which will first ensure appropriate financing, whatever happens to uh, the, finan the financing of the economy, whatever happens to the, finan to the, the fiscal situation in a country. Uh, we need to avoid these negative feedback loops and the interactions between uh, uh, hits uh, in the banking sector, hits in the, uh, in the, in the public sector, uh, which, by the way, increases the potential incidence of bank runs. Uh, we need to uh, foster confidence uh, in the financial stability uh, and from our point of view of central banks, we need to ensure a proper transmission of our monetary policy. I'll take an example which is neither French nor Irish, but uh, suppose that uh, the banks, because they are uh, seen as linked to the strength of the government and the rating agencies indeed change the ratings of the banks when they change the ratings of the governments. Uh, 
Suppose that we decide uh, in the ECB to move our uh, interest rate from 1% to 0.75. And we will try to, uh, we hope that there will be a transmission to the real economy and that it will help to revive the economy. Uh, we can do that because our projections in, the, in, in inflation are such that we have room. And it's even necessary to be closer to our target. We did that a few weeks ago. Now, what is the result? You go to Germany with a, a, a typical German bank, typical German SME, rate of credit to the SME might be, say, uh, 3%. So if we are lucky, it will move from 3 to 275 or something like that because the rates of deposit will follow our rate, so it works more or less properly. Then you go to Italy, northern Italy, another uh, good economy, with a bank which is as strong as the German bank, uh, effectively, in, uh, in, in, in its own quality. An SME which is absolutely equivalent to the SME I took as an example in Germany, so it should receive the money also at 3% and then 275. And what do we see? The money comes at 7%, 8%. And instead of moving down, it moves up because at the same time, one of these three agencies decides that uh, the rating is changed. So our monetary policy doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. And we cannot continue like that. We cannot have a monetary union with a transmission that works so differently. And I tell very often my German friends, uh, you would not have accepted that at the time where uh, the Bundesbank was making the monetary policy for Germany if the transmission had been so different, sorry, so different from one land to another land, that, that would not have been acceptable. So what do we need in short? We need three elements. Uh, we need uh, a unified supervision, which I see as the same kind of structure as we have for the euro system. That is, we need a central command and we need to have a decentralization of implementation because uh, it would be uh, ridiculous to, uh, to say that we should uh, centralize supervision for 6,000 institutions for the URIA, uh, speaking so many different languages. But we know how to make it work. Uh, we have that with the Euro system. Uh, the ECB is just the head, the central command but most of the work is being done by the national central banks, and it works perfectly well. And we have 12 years of experience. And uh, by the way, it's exactly like that, that it, it works in the United States. If you look at the Federal Reserve System, uh, the, the supervisors, the teams of inspectors are not in Washington, D.C., in the Board of Governors. There is a central command there. But the guys are in New York, in Chicago, in San Francisco. And if you look at the for the, the, the small and medium-sized banks, the FDIC and the national supervisors, it's even more obvious that you have 50 national supervisors, but clearly the central command, the authority to restructure, to, uh, to make resolution of banks, the authority to manage the deposit guarantee fund, the authority to command the national supervisors to size some, some of the issues is in the FDIC. And by the way, the Americans have reformed that after the crisis of the saving and loans in the 70s. So it's not that old that the United States have come to the conclusion that they needed to fix things and to move it at the federal level uh, in, in that kind of organization. And the two other elements we need, of course, is a coherent deposit guarantee scheme, probably uh, financed uh, with an annual contribution on all banks in the URIA, with the ability to borrow uh, in, for an intermediate period in the market uh, uh, with a supranational guarantee. And we need a banking resolution scheme with a resolution fund that could be either separate or mixed with a deposit guarantee fund and an authority to, to do that. Our view, as you know, is that um, the euro system will be well equipped to do that, to implement that sort of reform quickly. Uh, and uh, we have to note that uh, a wide majority, I think 14 out of 17 uh, countries have already their supervisor, which is either the National Central Bank or uh, very close to the National Central Bank in the hand of the, na the National Central Bank. So that uh, uh, moving in that direction 
should be uh, extremely, extremely easy. I think I will stop at that. Uh, well, if we move in that direction, we will still need numerous steps and uh, elimination of, uh, of substantial example. But if there is a strong political will, as there has been in other uh, areas, uh, I think it can work, it can work quickly. And we will move uh, towards a more coherent economic and monetary union. Uh, and I, I was very reassured by the fact that uh, at the last summit, uh, the political will to move in that direction seems, seemed clearly to be, to be there. Thank you very much.